Hey guys, Richard the Aficionado channel and Reefs.com. Thanks for joining us today. We are in a secret layer of ORA. Uh, now this is like the, the dream fantasy place for all of you captive bred or aquaculture specialists around the globe. And you know, for those of you guys who's been following my channel, following my journey for the last five plus years in Reefs.com, my second most watched video has been about clams and that's consistently getting views and consistently getting questions and comments all across the board. And I wanted to dive in a little bit deeper for you guys and talk about individual species of different clams that we have available and what better place to be than the holy grail of all captive bred aquaculture clams. I'm here in ORA with my good friend Jordan. How are you, man? Hey, thanks for coming. Appreciate it. And we will talk about this crochet clam that we have here today and learn quite a good deal about them. Let's get started. All right, here we have Tridacna crocea. These are one of my favorite clams, less known, but unrightfully so, than your traditional you know, blue maxima. Right. Uh, even though these carry just as many intense colors as your maxima clam does. I don't understand why there is less, I mean, less love about this clam, because I mean, like you mentioned, they do have a deep blue, just like any of the maxima, sure. but it has many different colorations built into them besides the blue, right. plus the blue, Yeah, right? I don't know what the deal is. I think it, it could be just availability, not a lot of farmers working with this species. Maybe it's just, they just didn't get the same yeah, kind of stamp uh, of approval from the Aquarium Hobbyists Association. Mm -hmm. What are the available colors of Corsia clams in the in a market? All right, so some of the best ones are gonna be these electric greens. We've got electric blues, we've got purples, we've got golds. What I really like are the combination of colors that you're gonna get. Yep, I really like that too. Some of the ones that I really like are the ones that are gold on the mantles, mm -hmm. but right down the center, bright electric blue. Yeah. In addition to that, yeah, you just, you have a, a good mixture of different eye teardrops, dots, all sorts of things that are gonna really pop in the home aquarium. And what's really interesting about these, this mm -hmm. species that I've seen over the years is, you can have one that just looks rather, you know, bland, just kind of a dark purple. Mm -hmm. Over time, it will develop into these like ultra patterned colors. It's remarkable. I don't see that in any other clam species. You know, you don't, mm -hmm. when you have like a, a dull purple maxima, it's gonna yeah. stay like that. But these, these actually I've seen change uh, in as little as like a month. Really? So do they, like, I guess they absorb susan bellies from, I guess, surrounding waters or something and develop? Or? They, it could be just buried in their genetics and they kind of, uh, Develop Flourish. it, yeah, as they get older and they, as they mature. Um, it could just be something we're not really familiar with yet. Gotcha. So besides the distinctive uh, two or three multiple pattern colors, mm -hmm. um, if they are both electric blues, how do you distinguish between Maxima and Cortia clams? Very good question. Uh, there's a few different ways you can see this. So I think the easiest way is to look at their shells. Okay. So I've got both species right here. Mm -hmm. Tridacna Maxima, Tridacna Procea. One of the things you're going to notice, first and foremost, is the shape of the shell. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a much more elongated shape with the maxima, with some pretty distinct large scoops that really stick out. Mm -hmm. Now your crocea, much more dense, tightly woven scoots. Yeah. The other thing you can do is if you're able to flip over the clam, you're going to see much larger, larger Bissell thread opening on a crocea. Yeah. Uh, maximas tend to be a little bit more substantially smaller. Visually. Right, right. And in the wild, I think that's that's because they, they these actually burrow into the rocks, right? That is one of the most remarkable things about the crocea clam is yeah. that you rarely will ever see one sitting up on top of a rock. These really start out very young, yeah, settle into the rock, mm -hmm. and actually uh, secrete uh, a digestive enzyme, not digestive, like a like acid. dissolving enzyme, mm -hmm. right, uh, that allows them to melt the limestone base and actually mm -hmm. sink into the rock. So only their mantle is exposed. Mm -hmm. So all you'll see when you go diving in a rock, is just a bunch of these, these mantles that will quickly retract into the rock. It's very, very cool to see. Gotcha, gotcha. And where are these clams usually found from? A lot of your clams are gonna be found all in the same rough geographic area that uh, our fish are found, you know, the okay. Indo-Pacific. Uh, Indo only the Pacific Ocean, uh, that tropical band, uh, anywhere between Thailand, Philippines, uh, and all the atolls out there in the Central Pacific. Gotcha. And then how big does this Persea clams usually get? So that's also one of the better features for mm -hmm. any kind of clam collector. Perseas stay relatively small, topping off around six inches or so in size. Okay. 
versus some of the other species, your Maximus, your Smosa Dracis, yeah. which, you know, get upwards of 30 inches plus. I have a Dracis that's like 14 inches right now. <laughs> and that's like half your own. You right, got a right, long right. ways to go. Right, right, right. So I think their smaller stature is a, is a, is a benefit to an average aquarist. So care level of these clams, right? Obviously, the Risa and Spomosas are usually the most easiest kept clams in the hobby. What are your suggestions? Well, how far has your knowledge have to be in order to keep these kind of clams? So specifically for Crusades, I would pair them right up there with your Maxima clams. If you can do SPS coral successfully, you're Which getting are... good growth, getting good colors, I think you'll be just fine with this level of clam. Okay. They like the high light, yeah. they like the super clean water. Mm -hmm. They need all the same components that an SPS coral uh, requires to grow. Gotcha. Now, when when these come in, you know, they're relatively on a smaller size, like an inch, two inches and stuff like that. Do they need any kind of supplemental feeding besides our fish poop? We don't do anything like that here at our facility. We don't mm -hmm. do anything like that on our farm. It's certainly not a problem, yeah. but it's nothing that I don't think, I think it's something that gets passed around a lot, but we have had, you know, monumental success without any supplemental feedings of uh, phytoplankton at younger sizes than two inches. Wow. Okay. Gotcha, gotcha. What are some of the telltale signs that you should avoid when you're selecting your Crusader clams? So, selecting a clam can be a, a tricky process. They can look really, really good, and then you bring them home to your home aquarium, and then they, they die uh, shortly thereafter. They can be pretty sensitive. Some of the things that you can do mm -hmm. at the store, kind of ensure a long-term success, is look at the clam itself. First and foremost, is the mantle fully exposed over the sides of the shell? That is right. a key sign. Yeah. Um, also, if you move your hands over the top of them, do they close back in? Do they, are they yeah, responsive to your and, motion? Right. Yeah. Those are the first easiest things that any aquarist can do when they go visit one of the fish store, right? You can, right. You can move a shadow, you can look at it visually. One of the other things you can do is if you have access to it, look at the bottom of the clam. That's actually a very, very good tip. Right. See the foot is damaged. Exactly. Or like that. You know, particularly in your wild collected clams, mm -hmm. they have to carve them out of rocks. They have to tear them out. Uh, right. In in doing so, the the parts of the clam that they use to attach themselves to the, the substrate, they get damaged. They oftentimes have to tear those in order to get the clam out, and that could mean that could be fatal for a clam. So with your captive red clams, you you don't have that nearly intense damage to the clam as often. Mm -hmm. But yeah, look at the bristle threads. Are, is there still kind of a good meaty uh, flesh there or is there just a hole upwards into the clam? That can be also a bad sign. Gotcha. So these, um, like what, what do they require from us to keep them thriving in our aquarium? So light is probably their first and foremost thing. Uh, clams are very photosynthetic. Think of them like a, like a plant. You're gonna want nice, intense lighting. In the past, I would say, oh, halides only. But now with kind of modern LEDs, we have the ability to replicate not only the intensity, but different spectrums. Right. And I think clams now do remarkably well, even under our modern LEDs. Gotcha, gotcha. So in addition to your bright lighting, mm -hmm. the other crucial factors that you need to be uh, aware of are obviously your calcium and alkalinity. Right, because they do suck up so much, but they do grow pretty quickly. Absolutely, so just like your SBS corals, they do have a skeleton. They're kind of one of those weird, remarkable animals where they have a skeleton, but a real soft, fleshy part. They're gonna be pulling calcium from the water in order to make that. And similar to how a tree grows, right. each of the scoots that you see on the side is another kind of level of development they're doing. And one thing I really like to do is whenever I'm looking for a clam is like when you look at the, the outer shell by the mantle, if you see that well, that's like clearly white, that means that that's a growth ring that, right. uh, that's there. And that's, it's, it means it's thriving, it's doing well. And that's a one telltale sign that, that I look for whenever I'm choosing a clam because it's obviously happy and it's doing well. It's growing. It's growing. Yep. You know, so. That's a good, thing, good point. So um, whenever you're looking for a clam and such, um, I know like we, for corals, we have different types of pests and stuff like that. And for clams, as we have them as well. Jordan, what are some of the stuff that we should avoid for? Okay. Look so out for. First and foremost, the pyramidal snails are probably the, the worst scourge of the clam existence. Yeah. So they're not always readily seen. Yeah. Um, they're certainly much more common in a wild collected clam. Yeah. Um, but what you want to see is you'll see tiny little white cone-shaped uh, you know, snails. Yeah. They'll be all up in the scoots, around the mantles. It looks like a white serif uh, shape, right. like, but it's tiny, very tiny, pointy, tiny. Very small, yes. Right. Uh, quarter the size of a grain of rice. I mean, really tiny little guys. Yeah. They'll particularly be right around the base and the bristle threads. That's why um, it's so important to look at the bottom because that's what they congregate that's usually. Where they go. And they start to eat the clam and they will be, they'll be fatal uh, if not removed. But the good thing is 
they can be removed manually. Yeah. Get some tweezers, get a toothbrush, scrub them off. Obviously, yeah. scrub them off in somewhere outside of your aquarium. Of course. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, those will be a big problem for, for a clam. Now, if you, if you, let's say that you find one and you have an infestation, can you do a freshwater dip on these? So, yes, that's one of the weird things about clams that I think mm -hmm. surprises and, and frightens people. Uh, you can actually dip these in fresh water mm -hmm. uh, and it's actually beneficial at times. Yeah. Um, so there are a number of different uh, pathogens that could be affecting a clam. Uh, you know, it's, it's not very well known what can affect them um, like it is like a fish. Mm -hmm. But a freshwater dip for about 15 to 30 minutes mm -hmm. actually can help remove a lot of uh, you know external parasites, uh, things that could be affecting the clam. Wow, 15 to 20 minute dip, huh? That's yes. a long yeah. dip, longer than I expected. It is. Well, it, yeah, it's yeah. terrifying, right? Like the first time you do it, like this doesn't sound right. Who puts a saltwater animal in freshwater and then right. expects it to be fine? But similar to how zoanthids close mm -hmm. up and you can keep them in a freshwater as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, they seal themselves up, they're fine, but everything that's been affecting them on the outside uh, will die. Will, will be, you know, drop off. Gotcha, gotcha. Now, um, I, I'm guessing if, I, if we do a freshwater dip, just like any other corals or even the fish and stuff like that, I, I'm assuming that we, have, we would have to match the temperature and the pH, right? It's the best thing to do. pH, gotcha. uh, dechlorinate if you're going to be using tap water, if you're, you know, have no other option. Don't um, do that. Don't do that. Use ROTI. <laughs> right. Uh, and yeah, match the temperature. Make it just kind of a, a seamless transition as possible. Gotcha, gotcha. 15, 20 minutes. Wow, that's something new. <laughs> I mean, so if you want to go talk about that, some some amazing facts about these as far as they can deal with fresh water. A lot of these clams are found in the wild very close to the surface. So these guys love the more shallow water. Oh, okay, so okay. So they'll be right there. They'll be so high that during low tide, they'll be exposed for hours to, you know, the, the blistering, you know, 100 degree temperatures of the sun. Wow. The, the wind, the rain, uh, and then the tide comes back in and they're fine because they're they're seal, they seal themselves in like their little shell and they're fine. So for like, I, I have heard this from many different sources. Do you burp these clams? Show me what you mean. So whenever you get a, like a, whenever a clam is exposed to the air, you flip it upside down and then you let the air come out. Okay, well, I was hoping for an actual physical demonstration. Oh, sorry. I want to see what you do. <laughs> uh, we don't. Okay. I think you can, mm -hmm. but I don't know if it's absolutely necessary. Uh, again, these animals are found exposed to air all the time in the wild and nobody's out there burping them, getting Very the true. air out of them when they've been exposed to low tide. I think yeah. these animals have evolved to be able to process air and get it out of their bodies, but it certainly doesn't hurt to dip it up, you know, turn it upside down, let the air out if it is in there. Right, right. But I think more often than not, you'll be fine. Gotcha. If you're thinking of getting into the, the jewels of the sea, you know, the, the yeah. Tridacta crostea clam, I highly recommend it. If you're doing well with your corals, I think it'd be just fine with these. Uh, what's really great about these you can keep them multiples in a tank. You can create a really beautiful display on a rock work and create a really good conversation speech in your uh, in your home reef aquarium. You know, it's funny that you mentioned that because Julian Sprung actually has it on, on cover of his oh, book. Oh, that's right. Exactly yeah. right. Yes. And then he, he had that in actually like a two gallon tank. That's it. Yeah. Fantastic. Isn't that just crazy? It's wild. <laughs> so yeah, absolutely. These things, they're almost, they're, they're collector pieces. You know, mm -hmm. you, you won't have the same pattern. You won't have the same colors create something really beautiful in your home aquarium. Uh, and just remember, the best way to view a clam is always gonna be top down. Gotcha. And if people wanted to purchase your ORA, like aquaculture clams, where did they get it from? So we've got a vast network of ORA partners all the way across the United States, mm -hmm. internationally as well. Um, you simply can either check with your local fish store, mm -hmm. uh, you can reach out to us at any time, and we're happy to coordinate with wherever you wanna shop. Perfect. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you guys learned quite a few things here. I certainly have. I didn't know that you could dip it for that long, but it's very interesting to find out from the pros and, you know, you learn all their, you know, do's and don'ts. <laughs> but anyway, thank you so much for watching and have a great day. See you later.